Hi, this is Chaplain Greg with The Wandering Wesleyan, and we're doing our Walking in the Word series, and uh, we're going pretty quickly through the Torah, and uh, we're in Brashit, and we're finishing up Brashit this week, uh, Brashit being in the beginning, or the book of Genesis. And we've been tracing this one family, starting with Adam, going to his son Seth, going from Seth to Noah, Noah to Shem, Shem to Abram, Abram to Isaac. Where we left off, Isaac gets married. But before then, Abraham is given this amazing promise that God says, my covenant is with you. You will be my people. I will be your God. Anybody who curses you will be cursed. Anybody who blesses you will be blessed. And you will be a blessing to all nations, meaning the world. This is the promise that God gave to Abraham that was to continue through his sons, through his lineage. And we see that coming up here because Isaac marries Rebekah and has two sons, Jacob and Esau. Now, Jacob and Esau interesting story again i'm so glad that we have a bible that shows messy people because if you're a parent like i am and you have kids i have two kids and i love them both equally i couldn't love one more than the other um but here we see a family where Mom loves Jacob more than she loves Esau, and Dad loves Esau more than he loves Jacob. This is a problem. And it's a messy family dynamic. When Jacob and Esau are born, Esau is first, so he's the older brother. Jacob comes out. And he's holding on to Esau's heel. And that's really symbolic of the relationship these two will have. Now, let's get a little cultural background to what's happening here. With Jacob being born second, he would have a lesser place traditionally in the family lineage. Esau, being the older would receive the birthright and he would also receive the blessing. What are those two things? The birthright would mean a double portion of the inheritance. So in, in Isaac's case, Isaac had two sons. So when Isaac dies, his estate would be split three ways. The oldest son would get, Esau, would get two parts. And the youngest son, Jacob, would get, I'm so, yeah, Jacob would get one part. Okay? So, Esau has this birthright. However, he sells it. He sells it to Jacob for a bowl of stew. I hope it was really good stew. Because he gave up his double portion in order to have a bowl of soup. The Bible says that he disdained his birthright. Well, both of them actually did. Because you think of Jacob thinking that he could buy his father's birthright, the gift that would come from his state for with just a bowl of soup, means that he disdained it just as equally as Esau did. So Esau now loses what's essentially a third of his father's wealth. What happens after that is that Jacob then, at the end of Isaac's life, deceives Isaac. And Rebekah, she helps him. Actually, Rebekah instigates the whole thing. And deceives Isaac into giving the blessing on Jacob. Why is that important? 
the blessing that the father gives to the son means that the family's lineage will now be traced through that son. It was supposed to go to Esau. But Isaac instead put it on Jacob. This angers Esau, as you can imagine, tremendously. The first time he sold his birthright, it was just foolishness. Now he's been tricked. He's been tricked out of the blessing. So he's not going to have the family line go through him. So Jacob runs away. And he goes back to where his mother, uh, Rebecca, came from. And uh, when he shows up, he falls in love with a woman named Rachel. Rachel has a sister named, an older sister named Leah. Now, here's the, here's the problem. When Jacob goes to Rachel's father to ask for Rachel's hand in marriage, he committed a serious cultural faux pas. He really transgressed the norms because it would be very insulting to the family that the younger daughter would be asked to be married before the older daughter. It would doom the older daughter to a life of spinsterhood. Had Jacob waited for Leah, the older daughter, to be married off and then asked for permission to marry Rachel, there wouldn't have been a problem. So Rachel's father says, sure, work for me for seven years. And at the end of seven years, I'll, I'll give you Rachel. Jacob works for seven years. And he goes to have his wedding night. And on his wedding night, he gets super drunk. A lot of drinking in the Bible. He gets super drunk. And instead of Rachel, he's given Leah. And he's so drunk, he doesn't even notice. He goes back to the father. Father says, eh, work for me for another seven years. This time I'll give you Rachel. He does that and he marries Rachel. Now, we talked about this in a prior video where polygamy is something that happens with high frequency through the Bible. And the key is it never turns out well. And that's the case here. There is bitterness. There is strife. Um, in fact, there are slaves that are given to Jacob. Leah's slave and Rachel's slave is given to Jacob. And out of all of these relationships between Jacob and these four women come 12 sons. Jacob eventually leaves the land of his mother's birth to go back to Canaan. God calls him back to Canaan. And he's got to confront Esau. He has two wives, two concubines, 12 sons. He's very, very wealthy because God blesses him. God promised that. I'm going to bless those who bless you. And, he, and he's blessed with a multitude of uh, animals and, and crops. And he's just very, very wealthy. And he knows he needs to head back to Canaan. And before he gets back to Canaan, he has, well, there's this odd story. It's a very odd story. And he has a wrestling match with God. And this wrestling match is, it must have been solved. So in chapter 32, this is where Jacob is preparing to meet Esau. And before he meets Esau, in uh, chapter 32, starting in verse 24, he has this wrestling match with God. 
and they go back and forth all night. And the language says that when the man, now it's never described as God, but this man shows up, has a wrestling match, we're to interpret that as being God. When the man saw he could not defeat him, meaning Jacob, he struck Jacob's hip socket as they wrestled and dislocated his hip. So basically, God came off the type rope, top rope with a flying elbow, hitting him in the hip, dislocating the hip. And Jacob said, let me go for it is daybreak. Or that's what God said. God said, let me go for it is daybreak. See, Jacob's holding on to this man. He doesn't know he's God yet. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. Jacob, he replied. Verse 28. Your name will no longer be Jacob. It will be Israel. Because you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Israel's name means one who wrestles with God. So apropos when you think of the nation of Israel, both ancient and modern, wrestling with God. Then Jacob asked him, verse 29, please tell me your name. But he answered, why do you ask my name? And he blessed them there. And Jacob named the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. He's realized this is God who he's been wrestling with. Yet my life has been spared. The sun is shown on him and is passed by Peniel, limping because of his hip. That is why still today, see, this was written, you know, th this was written way after this. Still today, the Israelites don't eat the thigh muscle that is the part of the hip socket because he struck Jacob's hip socket in the thigh muscle. Jacob's name is switched to Israel. Now, I mentioned before that Israel, formerly Jacob, had 12 sons. His second to the youngest son is named Joseph. Joseph, well, he's kind of a bragger. He thinks he's all that in a bag of chips. While the, son, while the other sons are out in the field, he and his younger brother, Benjamin, stay home. Benjamin's too young to be in the field anyway, but Joseph isn't. He could go out in the field and work too, but he doesn't. He stays home. In fact, he gets this gift of this wonderful, beautiful coat from his dad. He's given these, these visions which show that the, the other sons are going to bow down to him someday, and he goes out and he brags about it. Well, this makes his other brothers just absolutely infuriated. So what do they do? Well, they decide to kill him. But the oldest son, Reuben, says, don't do that. That's not a good idea. Let's just put him in this pit and we'll sell him to slaves, which is what they do. They sell him into slavery. All right. Joseph then goes to Egypt, and I encourage you to read that part of Genesis where he is in Egypt, and he is refined from this braggy, whiny, lazy kid into a solid man of God in a pagan environment, go figure. Now we're going to take a break from that story for a second. Because the rest of the family is still in Canaan. And many years go by, and a famine comes to the entire land. And Joseph gives Pharaoh, who is the king of, who is the king of Egypt, uh, a heads up that this famine is coming and that they need to prepare for this famine. Meanwhile, remember Super Friends? Meanwhile, at the whole of Joseph. No. Meanwhile, back in Canaan, they're going through this famine. And Israel says to his sons, go get some food from Egypt. They go down to Egypt. 
And through a series of events, and again, I encourage you to read it, they were reunited with Joseph. What these boys intended for evil, and this is what the Bible says, and this is what Joseph tells them, what they intended for evil, God turned into good. And so Israel and the rest of the family go to Egypt and they settle in the land of Goshen. And on his deathbed, and this is where Genesis Bereshit ends, with the blessing of all the sons. And there's one blessing I want to point out here. And this is in chapter 49, verses 10 through 12. And this is to his son, his fourth son, not his first, not even his second, but his fourth son, Judah, where it says the scepter will not depart from Judah or the staff from between his feet until he whose right it is comes and the obedience of the peoples belongs to him. He ties his donkey to a vine and the colt of his donkey to a choice vine. He washes his clothes in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth are whiter than milk. What does that mean for crying out loud? It's the most positive of blessings that Israel has for his sons. And he's telling Judah you are going to be the line of kings. The scepter will not depart from Judah or the staff from between his feet. That Judah is going to be a lion. The lion of Judah. And that's where we're going to stop for today. The line of redemption. Abraham. Seth, Noah, Shem, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah. But Judah is not going to come into play for another couple books. In fact, he's really not going to come to play for the rest of the Torah. The Levi, brother Levi, is going to have a big role. His people his descendants are going to have a big role in the rest of the Torah. But remember Judah. Remember that promise that God gave to Judah. So next week, we are going to start with the book of Exodus. And we're going to learn about what happens with Levi's descendants, starting with two guys, Moses and Aaron. Heard of them? I'm sure you have. But until then, this is Chaplain Greg, the Wandering Wesleyan. Uh, if you enjoy these videos, please like and subscribe, share them with friends. That'd be great. And uh, I'll see you next week. Be blessed.